the 632nd holder of an office so ancient that at least one of his predecessors has become the hero of a fairy story. The leader of a city so old that it was probably a thriving center of commerce before the Roman Empire. So old that it has no charter, only royal confirmations of rights and customs that it enjoyed before England had a king or charters had been thought of. Like so much of the city's pageantry, the Lord Mayor's show has simply grown. But this city of London is no museum piece dreaming of past glories, of the days when it taught all England the pattern of local government, indeed of Parliament itself. For this is a modern city, a progressive city, that still sets a pattern for others to emulate. It is in the Guild Hall that the new Lord Mayor's real duties begin, with the first meeting of the Court of Common Council. He is their head and chairman. But the actual business of the meeting is conducted in his name by the town clerk. Domino, dirige, nos. O oh Lord, direct us. The hmm. traditional prayer and motto of the city. Item number one upon the agenda, that the minutes of the last court, which have been printed and circulated, are correctly recorded. To agree, on the contrary, the Lord Mayor declares the motion to be carried. Members of this honorable court, the pomp and circumstance of this honorable court is only one side of the picture. Behind the pageantry is an equally long established tradition, that of a highly efficient and businesslike body of men whose collective experience it would be hard to equal. The blue gowned common councilmen led by the chief commoner are elected for one year. The red gowned aldermen are elected for life by the ward voters and not as in other cities by the council. They are justices of the peace by virtue of their office, the only ones in Britain who can sit individually, and they also attend at the Central Criminal Court. They meet as a court of aldermen for various municipal purposes, and each presides at meetings within his own ward. And it's these three elements, common councilmen, aldermen, and the Lord Mayor himself, which embody the government of the city. A great city, and yet within the vast area of Greater London, the city itself is only a fraction more than one square mile, a compact nerve center whose activity is felt all over Britain and all over the world. There can be few human enterprises anywhere that have no links, either direct or remote, with the daily work of the half million men and women who stream every morning into that historic square mile. But at night, no other city in the world is so incredibly transformed. The half million become a bare 5,000.
the morning and back to business. The business, for example, of the 30 or more committees which run the day-to-day -day work of the corporation. The chairman of the Bridge House Estates Committee. My Lord Mayor, I'm obliged to the Honourable Member for having given me notice of this question. Traffic movement over Tower Bridge is heavy... Roman London owed its importance to the fact that its site was the lowest practicable crossing of the Thames. So the guardianship of London's bridge is perhaps the most ancient of the city's functions. Until the 18th century, there was only London Bridge. But London Bridge has now been joined by three other road bridges, Tower Bridge being the newest. All four are owned and maintained by the corporation and financed by the Bridge House Estates Fund. The Lord Mayor declares the reports of the Bridge House Estates Committee to be carried. Item number 23. These are reports of the Improvements and Town Planning Committee. My Lord Mayor, in uh, presenting uh, to this honourable court... Twice uh, in three centuries, view, the city has been wholly or partially destroyed. The Great Fire of 1666 wiped out four-fifths of the gable tangle that made up the medieval walled city. Tragedy offered opportunity. The great Sir Christopher Wren drew up a plan that would have given London wide, straight streets and a Renaissance atmosphere. But in the distress and chaos that followed the fire, his plan was still born. And London's maze of timber and plaster was merely replaced by another maze, this time of stone and brick, for at least one lesson had been learned from the great disaster. All the same, Wren did leave his mark on the city. Beautiful churches, some of which happily survived the second destruction, the Blitz of World War II. Wren's Great St. Paul's Cathedral looked down on acres of utter devastation. This time, however, the city would not repeat the mistakes that frustrated Wren after the Great Fire. By 1947, the corporation's reconstruction plan was ready and was carried out as fast as national necessity would allow. The coloured areas in this map are scheduled for complete rebuilding. The colours represent the phases of short and long-term schemes up to the year 2005. So the city, while treasuring its own history, looks actively to its future. First priority goes to spacious and efficient office blocks designed for the pace and complexity of modern economic life. But the city is no longer content to hand over the night hours to the policemen, the caretakers and the cats. The handsome Golden Lane housing estate is one of the first achievements of a plan which, without altering the city's basic character, will double or treble its resident population. And the climax of this plan is a project that has captured the public imagination, the Barbican redevelopment shown in this model. This 20 million pound scheme envisages a complete community of more than 2,000 flats with elevated pedestrian walkways, green spaces, a lake, theatre, art gallery, shops, garage space and everything that makes for civilised living. A residential oasis within the city. 